Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Uh, again, I am Mr. Shuffield. I am uh, teaching you about the SAT today. So we'll be talking about the verbal section specifically. So there are several different types of questions on the verbal. Uh, we'll be focusing on uh, the sentence completion and then also uh, touching on uh, one of the passage questions. So as I'm sure you know about the SAT, there are a couple of things that are very, very important uh, for you to know before you go into taking the test. Uh, the first one, uh, it's heavy on English grammar. So if this is really a, a weak area for you, uh, obviously it may be uh, a little bit of a struggle um, with English being your second language. It's not as intuitive uh, as it would be for somebody who's grown up speaking English their entire life. Uh, so just immersing yourself in English as you're doing here uh, is a great way. So continue to, to do that. Uh, place yourself in situations where you'll have to use English and have to figure out its grammar and the rules and how it works. And that way you'll begin to notice relationships between words and uh, things along that line. Uh, the second thing that's really important is vocabulary. Like it or not, uh, it's a huge part of the test and the, the test is built to see what kind of vocabulary you have. So people with higher vocabularies generally tend to score higher on the SAT, especially the verbal section. Um, so if you feel like this is a weak spot in your test preparation, uh, I'd advise you uh, to go and find a list of just SAT words. You can probably just Google SAT words. Um, if you need my help later on, I can help you to find uh, some of the better lists. And these will, uh, studying these, studying the definitions of words uh, and what they mean will help you uh, when you especially are, are doing the sentence completion. Although it will also help you on the passages if there are words that you don't know and they're critical to the context of the passage. So particularly for the sentence completions, um, I'd recommend finding a list of about 3,000 vocabulary words uh, to start out with. That's what I was given uh, when I was in high school, uh, taking the SAT about five years ago. And I knew maybe half of the words and studied the rest. And I wish I had studied them a little bit harder because I only missed two questions and both of them were vocabulary words that I didn't know that had shown up on that list. And I recognized them but didn't remember their definitions. So just keep that in mind. This, this is a really important uh, aspect of the SAT and they're, they're trying to trick you with these questions. So with that said, uh, let's go ahead and get into it. So the first question uh, that we will be looking at, uh, I'll go ahead and read it to you, um, is number one, the blank of Maria Irene Fornes's play Mud, a realistic room perched on a dirt pile, challenges conventional interpretations of stage scenery. So there are a couple of different things that you can do when you're trying to answer a question like this. Uh, first of all, if you know what all the answer choices mean, you can just go through and eliminate uh, the ones that are not correct or just you know zero right in on the one that you know is the correct answer. Um, for an English speaker uh, who's a native speaker this is one of the easier options uh, particularly after you've developed a stronger vocabulary base. Um, however, uh, one option that I've started to think is pretty helpful for me in taking a test like this uh, is to go through and uh, choose a word that you think should fit into the blank before looking at any of the answer choices. So once you've done that, um, if you know any of the answer choices to be synonyms with the words you've chosen, uh, you can move on quickly and it will be uh, you know, that much more time that you have to work on the other questions. Um, so yeah, we've so the blank of the play challenges tr conventional interpretations of stage scenery. So it, the, the dashes indicate that they're giving you a definition of the word that they use. Um, so whenever a dash like that is used, uh, you can think, okay, a definition. So a realistic room perched on a dirt pile in a play. So what might that be? Uh, it's uh, how the play is staged. It's a uh, part of the play. So maybe the setting of the play uh, is something that you could think about. And then when you look at the answer choices, you see that setting is one of them. Um, so that's right there. You can tell that's the one that you think is best. So to double check, we'll go ahead and look at the other uh, words, the other answers as well. So the appeal of the play um, challenges conventional interpretations of stage scenery. So this isn't exactly correct, 
because uh, the appeal of the play means the way that it uh, connects with its audience. So the connection with the audience won't be challenging the conventional interpretations. Something within the play has to be challenging the conventional interpretations. Um, the plot of the play is within the play, um, but because we saw these dashes uh, giving us a definition, we can see that a realistic room perched on a dirt pile is not a plot. Um, that's a specific location within the film and a way that the, the or within the play and the way that the, the playwright uses to uh, set up what she is wanting to do. Um, again, the mood uh, is something that's a little bit closer to our um, predicted answer choice of setting. Uh, but does the mood challenge conventional interpretations of stage scenery? So this word scenery is another key uh, component of choosing our answer. Uh, scenery is a word that's related to a film's setting. So the way that a film is set uh, is its scenery. Um, so we can go ahead and eliminate the first three. And then the rehearsal, um, so the word rehearsal, as I'm sure you know, means uh, to go over something uh, again and again. So we are rehearsing these SAT questions uh, in preparation for the test. Um, so the rehearsal of the play um, would not be able to challenge conventional interpretations of stage scenery because the most important part of the play is what actually happens with the audience. So because of this, we can tell that the answer choice uh, is clearly D, and we can move on. Um, so number two, ironically, an affluent society that purchases much more food than it actually needs, so it purchases more food than it needs, think what kind of words uh, this might evoke, um, suffers because of that blank. So uh, maybe a word that could fit in there, they've, they've purchased more food than they actually need, so maybe overuse, maybe excess, um, something that goes above and beyond what they actually need. Um, so a word that, in, that uh, implies um, an abundance or something along those lines. Um, so you can go through the first words, um, the first answer choices, since this is a double blank uh, completion question. You can go through and eliminate answer choices pretty quickly just by the first word that shows up there. Um, so lavishness, overabundance, uh, and maybe corpulence are words that kind of go along with our, our synonyms of uh, the word that we've come up with to fill in the blank with. Um, so we can go ahead and eliminate answer choices D and E immediately. Um, practicality, uh, purchasing more food than you actually need is not practical at all, so practicality is a wrong choice. And then also commonness, uh, just because that word is irrelevant to uh, the situation of an affluent society purchasing more food than it needs. Uh, so lavishness uh, could be correct. The word lavishness, as we know, means uh, something that's very fancy, uh, something that is, you know, you pamper yourself with something that's lavish. So you know, having extra food could be lavish. Um, and then corpulence just means uh, being fat. So a society could be fattened on uh, its abundance of food. Uh, and then overabundance, obviously, is maybe the one that's the closest to what we, we have thought. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the second blank and see which of these we can eliminate. Um, so it suffers because of that blank. Since in conditions of affluence, diseases related to overeating and poor nutrition seem to blank. So diseases, um, we can try and plug in a word. Uh, it seems that diseases are uh, becoming more widespread. Uh, they are, they're growing. They may have uh, some more uh, just success in infecting humans than they had before. Uh, or in a society that doesn't have an overabundance of food. Um, so the word that fits that the best is thriving. Thrive. 
they seem to thrive uh, in, in conditions of affluence. Um, so, adapt is a word that could possibly complete the sentence and make sense, um, but it isn't the best answer choice because uh, you would need some kind of context to further explain uh, how they adapt or why they adapt um, and what the effect would be on the affluent society after that. And then vex is a word that means to irritate or annoy or cause problems. Um, and it's a word that, that doesn't really make sense in the flow of the sentence. Um, so in English, you know that this is not a word that commonly comes at the end of sentences. Um, no one would say uh, diseases related to overeating and nutrition seem to vex. Uh, generally, vex is associated with an object or with a, a subject. Um, yeah, with an object. So uh, the diseases will vex something else. So this sentence does not have an object, so we know that vex is not the correct word either. Uh, so because of this, we can go through and uh, go ahead and choose answer choice B, uh, overabundance and thrive. And then we can move on to the next question. Um, so I will go ahead and move on to the second passage, um, to the, the passage questions. Um, so we'll be going over question number nine uh, in this one. Um, let me adjust my computer screen here real quick, just a second. Okay. So, uh, question number nine says, in lines two through eight, the author of passage one mentions activities that suggest dolphins, and then it gives a blank. So immediately we know, after having read uh, the both passages, that it's only focusing on lines two through eight of passage one. So studies show through dolphins can even recognize themselves in a mirror. So what are some of the things, uh, some of the activities that are in here uh, that the question mentions? Uh, so dolphins can understand sign language, solve puzzles, and use objects in their environment as tools. Uh, they have a language communicating information from individual to individual. And then uh, they can recognize themselves in a mirror, something achieved by very few animals. Um, so activities... Uh, in this thing are suggesting something about dolphins. Uh, so we see that the answer choice A are unusually sensitive to their environment. Uh, there's nothing in the passage to suggest that dolphins are unusually sensitive to their environment. Uh, there's no word used like unusual or any kind of synonym to that word. Um, however, in passage 2, there are words like that. Uh, so here you can see the test makers are trying to trick you. So don't let them fool you. Uh, go ahead and make sure that you use the limits that they set up at the beginning of the question. So you're only limiting yourself to uh, lines 2 through 8 of passage 1. So we can see that A is not the correct answer. Um, B, uh, dolphins do not generally thrive in captivity. Um, again, nowhere in these lines um, does the passage say anything about dolphins in captivity? So we know that captivity means uh, like dolphins in zoos or at uh, marine shows um, versus dolphins in the wild. Um, so we can eliminate that answer choice as well. Um, answer choice C, dolphins having a unique type of intelligence. Uh, we can see, again, there's no language about uniqueness uh, or anything else in here um, other than that dolphins can recognize themselves in a mirror, something achieved by very few animals. Uh, however, the something achieved by very few animals, again, does not fit into the parameters that the test maker set up. That's on line 9. So we'll want to uh, make sure that we focus on the lines that they set up. Um, again, they're trying to trick you. Um, uh, answer choice D, dolphins are uncommonly playful animals. Um, again, it doesn't say anything about dolphins playing. Uh, it's, it's very factual. Dolphins are transmitting information, using tools, understanding sign language, solving puzzles. These are all very analytical uh, acts and not very playful at all. 
So because of this, we can see answer choice E is the one that remains, and so must be the correct answer. Uh, however, dolphins having skills usually associated with humans makes sense because all of the activities that are listed in the passage and lines 2 through 8 are activities also associated with humans. Um, so as humans, we can use sign language. I'm gesturing to you like this, and this hopefully enhances your understanding of the material that I'm presenting to you. Uh, we can solve puzzles like these questions here on the SAT, um, they're very much puzzles uh, created to fool you. Um, and then we use objects in our environment as tools, so the pencils you're using to fill in the, the Scantron, and then also language and seeing ourselves in a mirror, which is uh, very uncommon for animals, um, except for dolphins, and we know also for ourselves, uh, since we are also animals, kingdom animalia. Um, so I hope that these uh, explanations were helpful for you, um, and I am very grateful for you for coming for this, to this class, and I hope that you have a great day and continue to study hard for the SAT. Uh, remember, it will be worth it. I studied uh, very hard for the SAT, and it paid off for me. I got a full scholarship and was actually paid to go to college, so it can happen to you as well. Um, you guys are awesome, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very, very much. Uh, and also, the Princeton Review, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.